Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, today we're taking a look at something, I don't know, is it interesting? I, I, I think it's interesting. The history of the tennis shoe, or the sneaker? Running shoe, I think shoe technology. Shoe technology. Maybe? How shoe technology has changed over the years. It's changed, it changed a lot, I feel like. And then whenever I kind of did my research, it was like, eh, maybe not as much as I or thought it did. Or did it. If you go to the idleman.com slash history of the sneaker, did you see that by chance? I, wow, I didn't. They have this amazing interactive history of the sneaker. Like running shoes? Like all the shoes. Like you can like, they're just like pictures of them all okay. lined up and you can like click on them and it takes you to another page of information about the shoe. It's okay. really very cool. I'll have to check that so, out. Yeah, you should check that out. So way back in the day, way back. So when you in say the way day, back, what are we talking Early 18th century. Wow. The first rubber soles and canvas uppers were created for the British Navy for their slippery decks. I would think I would think the rubber shoes would be... No, they grip. Haven't you ever worked in the food industry where you get those special shoes so that you don't slip on the floors? Yeah, but I feel like they're like not rubber. They're like, it's some rubber compound. I guess better than walking around in your gross feet. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Pim sole shoe. A rubber outsole with a canvas upper showed up in the 1800s, so that's what that was. Okay. So this this episode's a lot of fun facts. I don't know if you found the same thing. I feel like this is only fun facts. Oh, it's all episode of fun facts. But fun facts about tennis shoes. Right. So interesting, the one that I find... So I, I, I'm just going to do mine chronologically. Wow. So you got the first rubber-soled shoe. Uh, do you want some fun facts about the first rubber-soled shoe? But yours is a little different than mine. I, I have a different date, but we'll go with yours. I won't... I, I won't is mine any, earlier than yours? Yours is way earlier then, than yeah, mine. Then, yeah, I guess that I wouldn't. I, so I'm not going to debate that, because I don't want our, our, our fan base to see any discourse between you and I. That's probably for the best. Um, so, you, know, you know why they call them sneakers? Why? Because literally... They were not noisy, and you could sneak around in them. Unlike the hard-soled shoes yeah. that were there. It seems that weird. Time. Like, why did they need to sneak around back then? I don't think that, that they needed to sneak around, per se. It's just that you could sneak in them versus okay. the hard shoes before. Okay. Uh, fun fact, though. The first shoes, the pim soles for the Navy, did not have left or right feet. They were just How shoes. How uncomfortable I know. Would that be? <laughs> or maybe they're just really flexible so that... They deform okay. to your foot. Okay. But yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. So I think you have dates going on in like the 1900s, right? Yeah. So so I, m most of mine starts right in like the 1920s. So okay, let me hear about that. This cat, uh, Adolf Delser, um, he is what Delser? is Delser? Is that like Dassler? Dassler. Oh. Okay, I said it incorrectly. You're you're. you're I am the pronoun the pronouncing king. You're the pronouncer. You are the lexicon that wow. we have here at wow. uh, Unprofessional Engineering. Let's keep going. So Adolf. Uh, uh, is considered the father of the modern running shoe. So back in 1920, he started making um, running shoes. The cool thing about this one is, I think I'm reading this one, right? Okay. Uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, Adolf and his brother, guess what they started? Did you see this? I did see this. They basically started Puma and Adidas. I know. I had that in there somewhere. That, that's that, Yeah, that's super cool. So he started Adidas because yeah. that was his name. Yep. Uh, the ADI and mm -hmm. then the Dassler part was Adidas. And then his brother was like, I'm going to make my own company. And it ended up being Puma. And which they were, is and they crazy. Were both in the exact same town in yeah. Germany. So but I think that kind of stuff happens a lot where like well, think well, about well, sibling rivalry. Think about Al Gore and Ansys. Or were they were they kind of Yeah, Bustler was uh was an Ansys employee and oh. then was under a non compete for such and such and, amount of and time. As soon as and then as soon over, as it was over he magically pow, had code. Al yeah. Gore. Yeah. Interesting. So anyways, I, I FEA that. reference. Uh let me let me jump back a couple years. Okay. Uh, in 1916, Keds showed up, and apparently that was a big thing. And then in 1917, Converse Rubber Company 
uh, came out with the All Star shoe or the Chuck Taylor, right? the Chuck Taylor, what, what they ended up being. Well, I have some information about that. Ooh, okay. About the, see, and that's what I wear all the time still, which is kind of strange. They can't be good for your feet. Though. I'm certain they're not. No, there's like zero support on okay. those things. So, fun fact: the Converse All Stars were the official training shoe of the U.S. military during World War II. Which, again, that doesn't seem like a good choice. It doesn't, but, I guess, but considering there are other options, they'd be wearing wingtips. Right. And right? fun fact number two, if you get wingtips, <laughs> it'd be great. Well, what else do you wear? Uh, right? In 1923, Indiana basketball star Chuck Taylor endorsed the shoe, and they became known as Chuck That's Taylor All-Stars. where the Chuck Taylors came from. Fun fact number three. Oh, well, you were just full I'm of just them today. Them. They're the best-selling basketball shoe of all time. So suck on that, Jordan. Really? See, I find that hard to believe, but the internet's wouldn't be wrong, right? The internet's never wrong, but more. But see, but what's happened is, I would say more so than the Air Jordan, Chuck Taylors have been around a lot longer. So long, yeah. And it's more of a fashion thing. Yeah. Like, like you're you're pretty high fashion. Uh, yeah. Sporting and, my t-shirts. Yeah. And I mean, whatnot. you're our you're the fashion consultant from <laughs> professional engineering, in addition to being our lexicon. Right. Uh, and you wear Chuck Taylors all the time. I do wear them all see, the time. I can't wear. See, I went to Kohl's one day because that's the only place I shop because it's it's all I can afford on our unprofessional engineering money. <laughs> And I put on a pair of black Chuck Taylors, and I looked, and I was like, I look like a total moron wearing these. I think that's more a you thing, though. It's not the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm right. sorry. Okay, so not a, a shoe thing, but kind of a shoe thing. So I, I, I used to run quite a bit, and I used to have major knee problems. I remember when you ran. Major hip and back problems. Every time I'd run, I'd be sore, and every morning I'd wake up. So I read this book, Born to Run, and it was all about this tribe that would run crazy distances barefoot. And interesting, back in 1960, I have no idea how to say this guy's name, A.B.B. Bacillia? I think you nailed it. Okay, let's Bebe. say I did. A baby, A baby, Bacillia. He won the Olympic marathon in 1960 barefoot. In 1960? That's not that long ago. No, that's I mean, like yesterday. Basically yesterday, barefoot. Wow. So, so I started, I didn't, I didn't run barefoot. You were and practically I, born then. Practically. I didn't do the crazy five finger thing either, but I ran in these minimalist shoes. Did you? And oh, not the, the ones that like. With the finger toes? No, those no, are no, creepy. I, I didn't do those, but there were other brands out there. An interesting thing. So I overdid it. They gave this regiment where you're supposed to do like one mile on the first week and then two miles the second week. And I was like, ah, I'll just do like six miles yeah, day one. Terrible. Destroyed my calves. I couldn't walk for like a week and a half. Mm. Uh, but all my hip pain went away. My knee pain went away. My back pain went away. So I think there's something to the barefoot thing or the minimalist tennis shoe. So just putting that out there. Interesting. So And that comes up later on in some of our chronological history that i have when i ran the half years ago now i was running down the south side stretch of it okay. and i passed some girl who was ra running barefoot down carson street and i was like that is so disgusting yeah i like, mean if anyone knows pittsburgh that's not a place you yeah. want to be running barefoot you don't want to ugh, i don't like walking there in shoes right <laughs> all right so let's get back okay, on track sorry. you have wow. some more information here about about these guys right yeah so one of the uh, um about what guys about the brothers. Oh, no. I, I don't have anything else. Oh, you don't? Here. I thought you were going to talk about the Olympics and whatnot. No, no. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I do have that. That's right. Good I'm thing totally I'm here forgot. for you. I'm glad you're looking at my screen. Yeah. So, fun fact. Back in uh, 1936, uh, at the, the Dassler, uh, Addy Dassler, the German shoe designer, he actually gave Jesse, he gave Jesse Owens a pair of shoes and he won four gold medals. Just, just Jesse Owens, you know, like nobody big, right? But the crazy thing about that was there was a major like political thing happening at the time because four gold medals, four gold medals, but he didn't give the shoes to the German competitors. Like he knew that there would be some backlash for right. not supporting the German track team. Well, uh, but I think he also was a pretty good marketing person and realized, hey, I got to give this to the guy that I think the guy gonna that's going to win. So he gave him the Jesse Owens four gold medals, and, and they took off. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's really cool. It's amazing just how many of these things are tied to great athletes too. Oh, they all are. Like, oh, these wouldn't have been a success if this guy wasn't really good. Mm hmm. So. I guess let's let's skip ahead. Every website I saw, maybe you have something different, basically said 
nothing really changed until the 60s. And I feel feel that's hard to believe. I would say 50s. 50s? Okay. Because so 50s is whenever the Nike stuff kind of began to start to take place. I said they kick-started the shoe revolution Ooh. where Bill Bowerman of the University of Oregon, go Ducks, mm-hmm. uh, was their track and field coach. And so I want to take like all the minutes to talk about Bill because okay. I don't know how much you know about him, but his life was crazy town. Really? Yeah. So let's let's take a minute here. So his his story is his dad was governor of Oregon at some point in his time. So whose dad isn't? Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> he was in the military for World War II, organizing the troops' supplies and maintaining the mules they used to carry supplies into the mountains okay. because apparently that was a thing in world war ii uh he got promoted to commander and negotiated the stand down of Ger- of german forces near the Berner pass before the surrender of all german armies in italy what? like right before it he received the silver star and four bronze stars this is for the his guy service. that started nike yeah then he goes on and his quote men of oregon 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 I say Oregon. Oregon. Okay. I think I got yelled at for saying Oregon before by some of our friends. Anyways, the track team won 24 NCAA individual titles. They were juicing. (laughs) They probably were. Four NCAA team titles, 16 top 10s in his 24 years coaching, and only ever had one losing season. The teams had 33 Olympians, 38 conference champs and 64 all americans that's crazy town he then goes on to create a program for training runners at in high altitudes because the olympics were going to mexico city and so he's the one who came up with how to get people ready to run in those conditions kind of like like in kenya and whatnot how they're all really good at running thin air and people go to the, the mountains and stuff he comes up with that and he was then the head coach of the Olympic track team in 1972, uh, famous for the Munich Massacre, where some bad things went down. But anyways, uh, Bowerman was alerted during these Olympics that this was going on, and he contacted the Marines to come protect Olympians like Mark Spitz. So... You know, he's just there coaching away and being a hero again. And picks up the phone and calls the Marines. And calls the Marines, right. So what does he do? What does any of this have to do with shoes, right? So uh, he coached Otis Davis, who became a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Okay. So, you know, no slouch. And he try, he decided to help this guy out and created the first ever pair of Nike shoes. Contrary to what a lot of people say, being that the first pair of shoes were made for Phil Knight. So who cares? But this guy says he got the first pair of them made for his running. But at at the time, it was a... He started a company, though, with Phil Knight. He did. In 64, he created a company called... Blue Ribbon, right? Yeah, Blue Ribbon Sports. And I guess that eventually turned into Nike. Nike? Is that Nike? I call it Nike. I'm going to go with Nike, and you're going to go with Nike, so that at least only half of the times we say it is wrong. Yeah, 50-50. Okay? 50 50, 50. Uh, A little bit more. A little bit more about him. So he created the Nike Cortez in 1968, one of the most iconic shoes of all time. Look it up, and you'll recognize it. Okay. Uh, and it, it's super crazy as well. But then, one step further, one more thing. Do you remember the Rajnish, Ra, Rajnishi or the Rajnish? So it was this cult that moved into <laughs> Oregon. Okay. And they they were in India and people were flocking there and it was like this guy's not god but he's kind of god okay. and like like a cult, you know, and it's thousands and thousands of people uh from all I over the world. I can't wait to see this connection. They move in and they follow this guy called the Bagwan and moved to Antelope, Oregon. Like okay. right there. And this is this tiny little town, middle of nowhere podunky thing okay and one of the people in this town of like five people is bowerman's son john who him and his friends uh, in antelope didn't really like these rajnishi uh moving in and eventually they got them removed from america so if you haven't watched wild wild country uh it's a a little bit too long but it's on netflix okay. and it's this whole thing about this cult that moved in and there were bombings and shootings and poisonings what? and it happened not that long ago and 
then and, they and it got was Nike that out. got rid of them. Well, it was Nike's son that got okay. rid of them. Wow. So, anyways, that's all I had. Except that's... one more fun fact. Did you know Nike's named after the Greek goddess of victory? I did not know that. Yeah. That's now a you do. Cool name. All right. I think I'm done talking for a bit. Yeah, I think we need to take a break. We, oh. You really ranted there. Man, sorry. Let's like take a, a break for rant. a word for our from our sponsors. So I'm assuming it's either Nike, New Balance, Vibram, Reebok, Puma. Vibram? Puma. What's Vibram? Do you say Adidas or Adidas? Adidas. Okay. Someone told me that if you're in like Germany, you're supposed to say Adidas. I think that's just someone having fun with me. I don't know because it was Adi, right? Isn't that his name, Adi? Yeah. Adi does. I don't know. Maybe. Anyways, I do have some shout outs. Is that something? I love shout outs. Nick M. He suggested that we do an episode on the collapse list, which I don't know what that is, but he went on to explain a little bit, and it sounds like it's talking about how inefficient and unsustainable green energy is. So just a uh, ray of sunshine with that wow, one, Nick. Wow, tricky Nicky, kind of bringing a downer. Right. Then we got Manus from India writing in and suggesting we do one on how to file an engineering patent, which I think that's pretty interesting. That would be an interesting one because I'm sure the people that listen to our show are all filing patents. Probably. Quantum communication. Anything with the word quantum in it scares me. It does. And engineering of the Parker Space Probe. And then Brett L. also wrote in and shared with, uh, and he shares us with his makerspace friends in Cobb County, Georgia. Cobb County. Woo, woo. So shout out to Cobb County and the makers there. That's so that's pretty, pretty cool. cool. Yeah. That's a lot of shout outs. Yeah. We normally don't get that many. It was a busy week. We're f- really picking up speed. I feel like we're probably the most popular podcast like going right now. I'd say so. I think that's a safe assumption. Okay. Anyways, if you do want to show your support for how great we are, why don't you go to iTunes and write us a review and tell everyone we're great. It will help us be showing up in searches and whatnot. Yeah, if you don't like us, then just don't listen anymore. Good good advice. You like <laughs> that was No, that's solid. <laughs> uh, feel free to press the subscribe button and email us with your suggestions at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. All right, moving on. Do you have anything else about Bill? So, uh, just a couple, like, fun facts. So, um, they actually used a waffle iron to actually create the the pattern on the bottom of some of the original Cortez shoes. Uh, They sold these things out of the back of vans at, like, track meets and stuff like that. Because they weren't, like, yeah, they they weren't, like, they were a legit company and all that sort of stuff. But they obviously weren't the Nike or Nike uh, that you think of today. Um, so yeah, so literally a waffle iron and they would actually melt the rubber to get that pattern for more grip and tread. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And I saw that it was Bill. They say he's the one who was doing that, like in his kitchen, melting it Mm -hmm. down and getting that pattern. Now I wonder if that's actually what happened or if they just kind of build his tail, you know, Mm -hmm. like the tail of Bill Bowerman. Yeah, probably, because his was he, that's a pretty interesting story. Yeah, he's way so more well. interesting. I mean, if you put if you put your life and my life together, <laughs> it's like an eighth of his life. We stink. Ah, well, yeah. so a couple other fun facts. Uh, New Balance is actually Balance. It, it. It's called the Trickster. I think is the, the name. Trickster. The I, shoe. Uh, yeah. Okay. It, it, it's it, the New Balance Trickster is the first mass-produced running shoe. This is like back in like 1940 time frame. Like there was never mass-produced. It was always custom back then. Uh, so I'm gonna jump way ahead. Are you okay if I go to like the 70s? Do you have anything before then? Uh, I just wanted to say in the 60s, Adidas or Adidas. Is that right? Did I do it right? I, I think you did. Okay. Adidas wanted to change shoes up a bit, and they introduced leather in their uppers instead of canvas. And this sparked the experimentation of materials with tennis shoes. Okay. So go ahead, into the 70s. Okay, so 70s. So this is probably what's considered the biggest, most innovative thing that's happened in tennis shoes probably ever. Ever? I'm going to say ever up until, like, recent, because some things haven't really taken off yet but back in the 70s i think it was 73 4 5 somewhere around there uh eva or ethylene vinyl acetate 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 um or it's an air infused foam so that is basically what becomes the midsole of every running shoe 
ever made. The, 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 the shoes you're wearing now, the running shoes that most people wear are made of EVA. And what happens with EVA is, again, it's that foam that's air infused, but it has the ability to absorb the shock and absorb the pounding and maintain its, its shape. So it always goes back. I mean, obviously it degrades eventually over time, but it always goes back to its original shape. So it's super durable, super shock absorbent and super cheap. Oh, it's good that it's super cheap. Yeah. How come shoes cost so much then? Yeah, because they're nuts. Yeah, I think that is probably the biggest thing, though, is this EVA getting added in so that mm -hmm. you can now, like, run longer, probably run, run faster because you can, like, put a pounding on the ground then. Well, and shoes, the shoes themselves last longer. So previously, ah, yes. if you had just traditional shoes before EVA, you know, you might get, I think the average was somewhere in the neighborhood of, like, 150 to 200 miles out of a typical running shoe so you're all they now even i mean 500 i have so i think they if, have a recommendation i know that you're supposed to replace them after so many miles like if you're a professional runner like I you yeah like if you're like me a professional i think after about 500 miles you're supposed to replace your shoes because it eventually loses but the kind of running you and i do i i, I have I, shoes i, I have, don't do any so yeah. I, unless you're being chased. Right. I have shoes that are, you know, years and years old that I still wear occasionally, and they still have the exact... They're a little dirty, but that's about it. Okay. So, so again, not a whole lot goes on after EVA, right? No. But I do have a list of amazing shoe technology, and the amount of amazing this is varies. So okay. let me go through some of them throughout let the years. Let me hear it. I got a couple myself. So EVA was around 75 is okay. what I had it for. In 79... Kangaroos, do you remember those? Vaguely. Introduced to the side pocket. Oh, I do think So that there was, was necessary. There was a zipper. And they had like there? they were all like ridiculous colors, you know. You could put like were. your change in there. And I thought it was stupid, but apparently they were designed by a runner and he was like, You don't have pockets and stuff when you're running, and this actually that is, is useful. Idea. And I was like, Oh, it's not nearly as stupid as I thought. Uh, 79, aeronautical engineer Frank Ruddy added a gas filled polyurethane capsule. For cushioning. So, so that's like the Nike Air, kind of? I guess so. Like, like that like little just... clear window you could see that was an Air? And then squishes? Yeah. Okay. I thought that was neat, and that it was an aeronautical engineer. 81, Nike releases a molded midsole made out of uh, Phylon, a compressed EVA that was designed by Mattel for bath toys. So, so the reason that started happening in the 70s and 80s was... So previous shoes didn't have a lot of, um, I'll say, control to them. So basically what happened was you have these shoes that have a lot of uh, like, like midsole control. So it basically forces your foot into a certain position. And that's where those type of controlled shoes work. So people that have like fallen arches and, you know, plantar fasciitis, they have really high arches. So uh -huh. it gives you much more support for people with bad feet. And oh, well, there we it, go. It, it's a much harder material than the EVA. So they typically mix EVA and that together uh, to give you more controlled shoes. I like that you have some practical application here. Like, I barely know how to run, so it's good that you, you know. You look like a runner, though. You have a runner's body. Ooh. I was just talking about how I'm, like, working on my dad bod, and now you're telling me that I have a runner's body. I'm trying to play you up a little Thanks, bit. Thanks, man. In 83, the first air cushion shoe was created, again, the Nike Pegasus. 85, the Y bar by Converse was added for y increased bar? support and uh, protection from injury, which is ironic because, as we said, the All-Stars are basically asking you to break your ankle. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm surprised I have ankles left at this point. Yeah, zero ankle support. 86, the first gel shoe was released by Asus. I had a pair of Asics. Did you? Huh. 89, ooh, Reebok gets into the game and created the sweet pump that at, that added to the you shoe. You had it all the way back at 89? Yeah. See, I have it at 91. I do remember the pump. Okay, I had 91, 89. I had one. On. Did you? Yeah, I did. I had one of those, too. I think I probably had it closer to 91, though. Um, and 05 is my next one. Adidas has built-in computer and pressure sensors to change cushioning optimization. That Which that sounds much. expensive. Yeah. And then in 2016, New Balance, something or other, uh, is the first running shoe with 3D printed midsole. Only 44 pairs sold. See, so that's what I'm talking about. Created. Like, yeah. Created and sold. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about, like the technology advancement. I mean, really nothing has happened with tennis shoes since EVA for the most part. 
Uh, 3D printing is starting, and we can maybe talk about that after our next break, because I think we got to take a yeah, break here in a minute. let's get into the new technology right after this week's uh, Luke's rant. Okay, so I'm, I'm keeping my rant related to tennis shoes, and this is going to be Nike, okay. right? So was that mine or yours? That was mine. Oh, Sorry. That was you. James always yells at me whenever I can wah, shut wah. my speakers off. So uh, this is probably six years ago now. I don't know if you remember this. You could actually build a tennis shoe online via a Nike website. You could, okay. you could pick anything you want. The sole color, the midsole color, the upper, the laces, the, the support level. So I go in and I build the sweetest shoe you can imagine. And for me, tennis shoes are all about the crazier the color, the better. Okay. So that's why I love Asics because Asics always have like oranges and blues together and they're just really cool. So, so you like kangaroos too? I probably did. Okay. So I ordered these like $250 shoes online. They custom make them. And this was before you had podcast money. This is before I had my podcast money. So I order these shoes and they're non-returnable, obviously, because they're custom. And I order these shoes and they were supposed to be orange in like this bright, like patriot blue. And I get these shoes and they're like this salmon color (laughs) and like this baby blue color. And (laughs) my wife is like, you spent how much money on those shoes? Now, here's the question. Did she look over the colors before you pressed order? She did, because I I do have some color deficiency with my eyeballs. (laughs) She did review the color, because I always have issues with color. Um, So she reviewed it. It was orange and blue. They're salmon and baby blue. And they wouldn't take them back. And they wouldn't take them back. And I even, like, took a picture, and then I took, and then I had the website like screen capture and I was like these are not even close like I can understand a little bit of color variation so I refused since then I haven't bought a pair of Nikes since this was I don't know eight ten years ago maybe that they were doing this they don't even do the service anymore I don't think um but that was wow. the, the last time I maybe bought a we pair could of just Nikes. start a whole like movement against Nike I think we should. We probably could drive them out of business. And the other thing, too, is Nike shoes. I don't know if you wear Nikes. They're I very don't. narrow. So Do you have a yeah. fat foot? I don't have a fat Wide foot. I just, foot. it just, my, my toe box is very wide. Okay, then. Well, that was a nice rant. I liked yeah. it. And so, yes. Yeah, so don't buy Nikes. They'll never lesson, sponsor us Lesson now. here. Don't buy Nikes. Sorry. So, uh, sorry, Bill. You hear us, Adidas? There we go. Converse? I've been given Converse plugs all day, so. Yeah, I like them. Me, too. Okay, so hot new technology coming to shoes. Uh, you have something in mind? So I don't, I don't consider this new, but I talked about it, it's somewhat new. So this is going back to 2005, but I feel like it's starting to pick up some momentum, this kind of minimalist shoe uh-huh. movement. So uh, it all started with, like I said, this Born to Run book. And uh, Vibram is the name of the company. So you might see Never shoes. Never heard of this. And it's a Vibram sole. So if you look at the bottom of a lot, like a lot of hiking boots and hiking shoes, it'll say Vibram on the bottom. So they basically sell their technology, the the type of sole. So these Vibram Five Fingers come out in 2005. These are the shoes that have the finger toes in them. That They're are creepy, re- but I kind of like really them. Really creepy looking. But what they in it makes so much sense because I'm a medically trained person. I'm not. I'm just saying. Oh, that. so <laughs> it's uh, like I didn't know this about you. No, no. I was, I was, I was seeing how far I could take okay. it. Okay. But I mean, when you wear these, you're forcing your feet and your ankles to kind of stabilize themselves. The muscles in your feet are forced to work. So rather than having you know super high support shoes where your feet don't have to do anything. The muscles in your feet, the muscles in your ankles have to work. So uh, I think this is probably one of the, at least for me personally and some other people I've talked to, this this minimalist footwear has really helped with, with running, jogging, hiking, all that sort of stuff for me personally. So I think that's probably one of the bigger things. It's not super new. Um, and then the exact opposite of this... <laughs> Is have you seen these things? They're called Hoka H O K A. No. So this I really is, need to up my shoe game. So this is 2009. It's a brand of shoe called a Hoka or Hookah, and I thought that was something that you smoked out of a Hookah. I don't know about that. So <laughs> they introduced something called Max Cushion shoes. These things literally they have like pillows. <laughs> they have three inch soles on them it's literally like you stacked up like three inches of sponges 
and you run on them. So you literally don't, it literally feels like you're running on marshmallows. Wow. So those are the two, I think, biggest, and they directly compete against one another, which I think is interesting because they it both. Is. Let's see who wins. They both say, oh, yours is worse, mine is worse. Um, but I think. I feel we, like the natural one just makes sense. Like our body's built this way for a reason. Yeah. You know, it is. Putting something on your foot that's not natural might jack stuff up. Yeah. All right, I have a few things. Okay. So we mentioned 3D printing in the past already. Uh, Nike, Adidas, Adidas, Under Armour, and New Balance have all 3D printed midsoles. Uh, but but they're not mass production. Like, you and yeah, I can't buy Well, these. that's exactly it. They're far from uh, basically printing the entire shoe and making them in large batches. They're all very small batch, mm-hmm. and they all sell out because they're very novel. Uh, still better for less athletic shoes and more of a ornate design like it's just kind of looking cool uh though it can use a lot of different materials which is interesting i met a company at south by southwest a year or two ago that was printing shoes on site and they'd basically build them custom for your foot like you'd scan your foot and then if you have high arches it would uh print them to okay. support your how long did it take to print needs. like you could well do it you while would get you were it there no they'd have some being shown there okay. but then okay. they basically had a big warehouse of printers that just were like going nuts printing stuff okay so 3d printing is kind of cool another thing i saw and it's not so much shoe tech but it's image recognition and i thought this was kind of cool uh basically you snap a picture of someone's shoes that you like on mm-hmm. the street And the software, Amazon bought a company that does this, surprise, surprise, Uh, the software determines what they are and finds them on Amazon to buy them for you. So if you're like, I like those shoes, I want them, snap. So take a creepy picture of someone's feet. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. (laughs) I didn't think about that, but yes, being a creeper. You could just do what most human beings do. Hey, where'd you get those shoes? I guess you could do that. You could converse with somebody. I hate conversing, though. Yeah, I know you do. Uh, 3D scanning. So scan your foot, have the shoe created specifically for it. This is especially good if you have jacked up running feet like me. And then, you know, you put too much weight on the inside or outside. Before you move on to that one, the Uh interesting thing about that one is this is something that a lot of people don't understand about your feet. Uh Uh, The longer you're on them, the bigger your feet get. So if you're standing, so perfect example, I, I follow this guy on YouTube. He's a big hiker. He does the, the AT. So it's literally like, you know, months and months of hiking the AT. So he starts out at the beginning of like this three month, four month hike in like a size 10. By the time he gets to the end three months later, because he's literally walking and his feet are expanding. Uh-huh. By the time he's done, he has to wear a size 12 or 13 shoe. What? And it's because your feet actually... I don't believe that. Yeah. That's made up. Oh, I, I personally, I mean, I've done some long distance multi-day... Them? Well, they go back to normal when oh. you're not on them as okay. much. Yeah, yeah, it's not permanent. Oh. <laughs> I like, so eventually he just has these giant clown <laughs> feet. Like size 30. Yeah. So, but I per- I have some personal experience. That I've, I've done some long multi-day hiking, you know, 10, 12, 13, 15 miles a day. And by the end of like four or five days of doing this, my boots are crazy tight. Interesting. Like, I got to go to, like, a, a much thinner sock to be comfortable. Very cool. So, I think the 3D scanning is probably not a great idea because your feet are always changing. Well, so. we'll see. AR, another one. AR. Nike, Adidas, Lacoste, and more have been using augmented reality so that they can show you what you're going to look like in your new shoes. Oh, so I can, like, hold so my So, it's like, I got down. some new kicks. Is this what, what am I going to look like? Okay. Do I like them? I think that's a bit much, but, you know, go so to the are, store and So, look. are you a... The way a shoe looks, person, or are you more of like a function of it the shoe? It depends what it's for. Okay. Like, I couldn't care less what my running shoe looks like. So, like, but, when you did run. Right. You had but no my, care. No. But my uh, Converse, I like the way they look. Okay. Otherwise, no one should ever wear them. Okay. Is that a ring endorsement? It's the a, last thing I wanted a, to talk about was smart shoes. Straight out of Back to the Future, there's auto lacing shoes that are out now based on the person's foot, weight, and movement. Okay. Uh, they also track distance and travel, like distance traveled and your stride length. Uh, and there's also uh, shift sneakers that change color, which is kind of neat. Eh. So they have this re- reactive textile fibers with mini led lights in them okay and you can basically download upgrades to get uh design changes i could see that being like 
a fad for kids these days yeah. that are all used to like well, they downloading light those extra packs. When they walk, right? Yeah. So I have two fun facts okay, to and finish then I'll with wrap if it you up. think yeah. we're good. So I, I never knew this until we did our research, and I, I may start buying only New Balance because okay. interesting. New Balance provides all the running shoes for all branches of the military. And these running shoes... Do they donate them? Uh, I, the, the military buys them from New Balance. And the oh. reason is New Balance is the only manufacturer to only manufacture shoes in the United States. Is that right? So while some of the manufacturers are pulling a little bit of production to the U.S., the vast majority of every shoe manufacturer worldwide is done in China. That's that's wow. where almost every shoe that you and I wear is made, except for New Balance, 100% U.S. And these military running shoes, I'd love to get a pair. They have the insignia of whatever the branch of the military is on the tongue of the shoe. So it's like Very cool. you know, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, whatever else. Hey, there if is. any of our listeners out there have a pair of New Balance running shoes from the military, send us a picture. That would be pretty cool. That'd be very cool. Awesome. That's a really good fun fact. Yeah, so I think I might go New Balance only. They're, I think they're, you they're not as cool looking as Asics, um, but I might do that just to support the Americas. I support you. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I'm not sure how much engineering here there was, but it was interesting. A lot of history. If nothing else, it was interesting. It was very interesting. All right. Well, until next time. See you.